Hello, I'm Paul Cockshot. I want to thank uh, Professor Valle for arranging this session. I'm going to be talking about how certain concepts in physics and in information theory are very relevant to analyzing economic production processes. OK. This is an outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about why we're interested in the idea of entropy and work, where these ideas came from. Uh, I'll be looking from Smith to Babbage to Marx, asking what work is or what labor is. I'll then argue that a key to this is understanding the idea of entropy, which will follow from the ideas of Maxwell through those of Boltzmann to the ideas of Shannon. And at the end, we'll be looking at how these concepts can be applied to understanding mass production processes in the capitalist economy. What we're going to be addressing first is what information is. Uh, how does it relate to work? How does it relate to wealth? How does it relate to energy? And how does it help us understand the economy? And I'm going to look at Adam Smith, James Watt, Charles Babbage, Karl Marx, Clark Maxwell, etc. If you look at the classical economists, there's a certain consistency in that they all say that work or labor is the source of value. So we have Smith saying labor was the first price, the original purchase money that was paid for all things. We have Babbage, the inventor of the computer, saying the cost of any article may be reduced in its ultimate analysis to the quantity of labor with which it was produced. And Marx echoes these people by saying economy of time, to this all economy ultimately reduces itself. So working time was seen as the basis of value. So you get the common idea that value is equal to work time. Now, I'm speaking from Glasgow University, and at the same time as Adam Smith, who's Professor of Moral Philosophy here, and was working out the labor theory of value, uh, Dr. Black, who was in the Department of Natural Philosophy, what would now be called physics, was working with a technician called James Watt. And they were investigating the foundations for a proper understanding of heat and temperature. Now, you might think that Smith working on labor and value and Black and Watt working on temperature are quite different things but they actually have a lot in common. And by looking at the commonalities between these two areas, you can see how concepts from engineering science, from the practice of material production, were parallel to and became the foundation for classical political economy. I've got two images here of the steam engines of Newcomen and Watt. Prior to Watt's work, the type of steam engine in use was the one here. In this one, the wa water is boiled, steam goes into a cylinder, the cylinder goes up, a valve is then closed to cut uh, the steam off, and then water is sprayed in, cold water is sprayed into the cylinder, which creates a vacuum, which pulls the arm down, and then that pulls a rod up, which was then used for pumping water out of a mine. Now, what James Watt realized was that this was very wasteful in energy, or wasteful in heat, which would have been the way it had been thought of in those days, because the cylinder itself was cooled down by spraying water onto it, and therefore heat was wasted in doing that. His solution was to set up a separate condenser here, so that the steam was let out of that, out of the piston, down here and into the separate condenser where it turned into water. 
and this saved heat. Now that might seem a minor point, but that difference was the key to establishing the Industrial Revolution and establishing the mechanization of industry, because it meant that artificially created power became cheap enough to apply to general industrial uses. Now I've brought up a table here showing how actually the concepts being developed in moral philosophy and natural philosophy were very similar. I'm taking an example of whiskey, assuming that you have a factory making whiskey. From the point of view of Adam Smith, you would measure the price of whiskey in terms of gold guineas. From the standpoint of natural philosophy, you would measure its temperature using a merc mercury thermometer. Now those two things actually have a common mechanism. In, the, in order to use gold to measure the price of whiskey, you have to take into account the specific labour content of gold. And in order to use mercury to measure the heat of something, you're taking into account the specific heat content of mercury, how much heat is required to heat it up. You then have derive an equivalent, which is the value of whiskey, which you measure using gold in this case, and you measure the heat content of whiskey using mercury. Now, according to, to Smith, that value derives from labour, which is measured in hours. But from the standpoint of physics or natural philosophy, the heat content of the whisky is also measured in foot-pounds or horsepower seconds. Now, when we say labour measured in hours, that is actually man-hours. And this is in... I suppose in Watt's terms was in horse hours. And behind these lies the ability to work or labour power of the distillery workers on the one hand and the other hand is the horsepower of the engine which for instance is measured by raising barrels. So there is an, an analogous set of concepts which were being developed in 18th century, century natural philosophy and being applied in political economy at the same time. So we have the notion from Watt that heat is equivalent to work. You have the notion from Smith that work is equivalent to value. You then have a paradox, because we know that animals work as well. And Watt invented the term horsepower to measure work in terms of the equivalent labour of horses. He wanted to say, how much work is a steam engine doing? He said, OK, we'll take the, an average horse of average strength as the standard of work. Now, that's exactly the same as Marx later does. He says, we'll take a worker of average skill as the standard for the creation of value. But then why, why is it that only human beings are creating value? Why aren't horses doing the same? Because horses are stronger than us. And with the invention of the steam engine, horses became redundant. They became playthings, pets. And if it's the case that power, mechanical power, is the same as work, and if that is the same as value, why do human workers still survive? Horses have been eliminated. Why are human workers still surviving? Monk said there was a basic difference between human and animal work. In his parable of the spider or the bee and the architect, he says what distinguishes the worst of architects from the best of bees is that the architect raises his structure in the imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labour process, we get a result that existed in the imagination of the labourer at his commencement. So... This is essentially a teleological difference, that the object that is going to be made is conceived as residing in the worker's brain before they actually make the thing. But is that a really a fair assumption? Do animals really lack purpose? You know, 
spiders are very small with tiny brains, so you can believe it's just blind instinct that makes them spin. But if you talk about mammals, that's not a fair assumption. Uh, if, if you've got a horse being employed by a human being to plow a field, the horse certainly doesn't think about the corn that's going to be grown there, but that's because they're a slave. If you take a free animal, like a wolf stalking its prey, why do we not think that the wolf intends to eat its prey? And how is that any different from human activity? So it's not clear that that can explain why human labour is different from animal labour. And if we turn back to that argument of Marx, do architects ever build things? Occasionally an architect may build his own house, but in general what makes them architects is that they don't get their hands dirty, or rather they don't get their hands dirty with anything but ink. The key to human ability to make complex structures is that we can store the information required to build them in an external paper and ink plan and then other people can follow that plan. It's stored information that distinguishes us from the work of animals. Now what are the links here? We have what developing is steam engine? We have Smith developing, studying the division of labour. We then get it applied to a new area, the area of mathematics, because in France, de Prony is set by the French Revolution to construct a sophisticated and high quality set of mathematical and logarithmic tables. And he applies the division of labour to do that, including the a small number of skilled mathematicians who set out the mathematical plan and a large number of people who could only do addition who did most of the work. Now Babbage was a professor of maths and he studied this general principle of the division of mental from manual labour and he kept finding that in these log tables which had been prepared by hand there were lots of errors and he exclaimed to his friend the astronomer John Herschel I wish to God these calculations had been done by steam. And from that idea, he proceeded to invent the difference engine, which mechanized de Prony's manual division of labor in the production of tables. Here's a, a photo of the, division, of the difference engine as it was eventually constructed. It wasn't finally built until the 1980s. It was built faithfully following the designs that Babbage had drawn in the 19th century. It's worth noting this part here. To those of you who are familiar with computing, it will make some sense when I say that's the microcode controller. But basically that is the part of the mechanism that gives purpose and controls the operation of all of the rest of the mechanism. It contains a program, which is equivalent to Marx's idea of a system of intention. But what Babbage is doing is taking this system of intention and building it into a mechanism. In order to do this, he needed precision engineering. He had it to make very large numbers of identical cogwheels. In order to do that, he went out and studied existing production technologies and he, for instance, developed the technique of die casting. From what he learned there, he branched into political economy and wrote on the economy of machinery and manufacturers. Some years later, when Marx is in London studying political economy, he uses Babbage's work as a basis for his understanding of how automated factories work. So Babbage's idea that the key to, the, to automation is the development of automatic sequential control mechanisms which take control from the worker gave Marx the key to understanding the alienation of labour in an automated factory. So we have a sequence here that the ideas of Watt and those of, ba of Smith led to Babbage and Babbage's ideas were taken by Marx and uh, provide a justification for communism. Now I'm going to go back and look at 
other people who studied heat. In the study of heat, it had by the mid-19th century been established that the, the third law of thermodynamics applied. The entropy in any system tended to increase. Now, the entropy meant disorder. The physicist James Clerk Maxwell came up with an interesting paradox, which is, is known as, a, as Maxwell's demon. And he wanted to argue that, in fact, intelligence could create energy. And he said, suppose you had a very small being. He didn't call it a demon, but a small being who had a small trapdoor big enough to let atoms through. And you have two cylinders separated by a diaphragm and this trapdoor. When the demon sees a fast atom coming in from the left, he opens the trapdoor and lets it through. When he sees a slow atom coming from the right, he opens the trapdoor and lets it through. At other times, he keeps it closed. In consequence, after a while, you'll have slow molecules on this side, fast molecules on this side. That means this is hotter than that. So this means that information or intelligence ends up manufacturing energy, manufacturing heat. It took a long time before people were able to satisfy themselves why this uh, proposed demon was impossible. I'm not going to go into that in detail. Now, what's interesting about Maxwell's argument is it's explicitly materialistic. It's based on the idea that there are atoms. And Maxwell's work is carried on by Boltzmann, who was able to express entropy and the laws of thermodynamics in terms of the probability distribution of atoms. And he came up with his formula for entropy here, which is saying the entropy of a system is Boltzmann's constant times the a, func a partition function, which is a function saying how likely molecules are to be in a particular volume of space space, times the log of the partition function. And that's his formula for entropy. And he's able to show on probabilistic grounds that the, the laws of thermodynamics will follow from that. Now, in the mid-20th century, the electrical engineer Shannon, who was concerned with the transmission of information via telephone wires across the United States and trying to measure how much information was being sent over telephone wires, came up with a formula for quantifying information. And his formula was this, very similar to, to Boltzmann's formula, that the quantity of information H is the negative of the sum of the probability of any given message times log to the base 2 of the probability of any given message. Now, this is essentially the same as Boltzmann's formula, and Shannon immediately realized that. Um, Using this, he could measure the information content of messages, and he showed that you could never compress any message in such a way that if you expressed it in binary, it would contain less than H bits. The, the key point here is that Shannon had, dis, had shown that information is governed by the same laws as energy is. It's the same, the same formula for information is the, set, is the formula that Boltzmann used for entropy. There is a subsequent development of ways of measuring information due to Chaitin, which defines the information content of a number or a a structure as being the length of the shortest computer program able to generate it. This is a slight shift of terrain. Shannon was talking about messages and numbers are 
not necessarily messages, though all messages are coded as numbers. And if you have an information theory defined in terms of numbers, you don't need any a priori data about probability. Here's an example. That's the, the Mandelbrot set. Um, you're probably all familiar with it. It's a very detailed picture, but on Chaitin's theory, although that's a very detailed picture, it contains very little information because there's a very tiny mathematical formula. Z equals Z squared per C generates that entire picture. Now, what are the links here? Babbage and Marx thought that human work was a source of value, and that's an objectivist view. And Marx actually says that value is the crystallization of human energy. In the 20th century, economists rejected this in saying that value was something subjective instead. And the problem they had was that the work time theory of value didn't appear to have any plausible mechanism. And it wasn't until the 20th century that mathematicians and computer scientists came up with a plausible mechanism for why the work time theory of value is correct. Now, let's look at some, link, some further links here. Back in 1921, uh, Capek invents the idea of the universal robot in his play, Rossum's Universal Robot. And the universal robot was an android that could do any productive task. In 1936, Turing reinvented Babbage's idea of the universal computer. And the next talk in this series will begin by Professor Michelson, who will talk about that. Um, and the universal computer was one which could compute any mathematical function. And in computer science, we now use cycles of the universal Turing machine as the fundamental way of measuring the cost of an algorithm. It's interesting that in 1938, the first TV science fiction film uh, came out just after Turing had written this paper, and, and it was a version of Rossum's Universal Robot. Of course, the word robot in Czech just means worker. So Rossum's Universal Robots were universal workers. And this is the key to understanding the relationship between Marx's and Babbage's ideas of value. Human beings are the only universal robots so far known. We're the only entities we know of that can do any laboring task once they've been trained. And because of this, it's human time that remains the basic metric cost of any task. Because we are universal. Because the Turing machine is universal, time on the Turing machine counts as the universal measure of computational cost. Because we are universal robots, because we're universal workers, our time counts as the basic metric for any productive task. More links. It's in 1872 that Boltzmann founds Entropy on Statistical Mechanics. In 1938, von Neumann, in his model of general economic equilibrium, applies matrix mechanics to the economy. And in doing that, he was borrowing the matrix mechanics which he had previously applied to the formalization of quantum theory two or three years earlier. Then in 1948, von Neumann invented the current model of universal computer, which is not the, the Turing model, but an improvement on it. And that laid the basis for current computer technology. In 1948, a recursion theorist, that is to say, someone who studies recursive algorithms, showed that Babbage and Marx's theory of value follows as a necessary consequence of Boltzmann's entropy maximization in a chaotic market economy. That's the uh, Makova professor at UCL. And in 1998, Anwar Sheikh, in his empirical strength of the labor theory of value, 
applied von Neumann's maths and a von Neumann computer to empirically test Makover and show that Babbage and Marx were right about value. Now, I'm going to move on from value to look at Babbage's concepts of the labour process and how productivity can be increased. And there are three fundamental ways by which this can be done. One of them is by accelerating the production cycle. The second is by parallelizing production. And the third is by eliminating wa wasted effort. This is, is clear if you read Babbage and Marx. What's less well understood is the way that entropy and information play in all this. Consider the process of making a book. You can see it goes through two opposite phases. First, you make paper. Now, making paper is obviously an entropy reducing process. A blank sheet of paper is low information content with respect to the human language. It's got no messages on it. So from Shannon's point of view, low entropy. But it's also a low entropy state with respect to the raw material. In a sheet of paper, the cellulose fibers are all constrained to lie in a plane. And this implies a reduction in the volume of the state space that the fibers occupy. And from Boltzmann's theory, a corresponding reduction in their entropy. Next, you consider the process of writing text, whether by hand as it was in the past, or with a printing press. And this is an entropy increasing process because you add information to the book. And by the equivalence of entropy and information, we increase the entropy of the book relative to blank sheets of paper. So we have here a two phase production process, and we'll see this applies again and again in industrial production. In the first phase, the entropy of the material is reduced. You create a low entropy material. In the second phase, you allow the entropy to introduce, to increase in a controlled way. Natural information is removed and anthropic information is added. And it's the anthropic information that is determined by our own concerns. Now you can see this applies to the printing industry because books, everyone can see they contain information. But can you apply this to other processes of capitalist mass production? Now, if you read Capital, you'll see again and again he refers to the spinning industry. But if we look at the spinning industry from the standpoint of entropy, we can see it falls into this category. The starting material is wool or cotton fibres, which have a random orientation. The first thing you do in a spinning, pro uh, in a textile production process, is to card the fibre to bring them into rough alignment. You then twist them and spin them into yarn. In the yarn, both the volume and orientation are sharply reduced. So you've used energy of the, the steam engines that drove the spinning machines to reduce the entropy of the, the, the cotton. You then have a final process which increases the entropy by weaving cloth. And in this case, the fibers are oriented at two different orientations, so the entropy has gone up. But it's an entropy we've deliberately introduced in order to create strong cloth. And also typically to, to introduce a pattern by using different colored threads. The same thing applies to other industries which produce goods by preparing a flat material first. If you consider the production of cars, the first process is to produce rolled steel sheet. And this is then shaped using pressed steel construction techniques. You press it out into car doors, roof panels, etc. Now, it may be, seem difficult to measure the information you're adding here. Um, but if we use Chaitin's information theory, the amount of information you're adding is proportional to the length of the 
tape, which you feed into a numerically controlled machine tool, which will direct the carving of the die from which you press the, the car door, for example. Now, the other key process to increasing productivity is replication. And when you replicate, you have to make lots of things that are identical. Historically, the key example of this was the Colt Revolver Company, because prior to Colt, the gun trade was dominated by handicraft production, and the parts of guns had to be individually fitted to one another. Um, and they had to be filed down so that they would fit accurately together. Now, a, a roughly fitted part contains more natural entropy, more natural information, than a precisely made part. And the goal of the standardization of parts was to reduce the uncertainty, reduce the entropy of the components, and reduce the amount of natural information compared to handmade parts. Now, Prior to the introduction of numerically controlled machine tools, the production process, if it was going to have replicated parts, had to use parts which were either circular or planar elements, because the production process only had lathes or milling machines, and these either moved in a circle or in a straight line. Um, this, again, involves a reduction in information. Suppose you're making a gun barrel. You only need to supply two numbers. You need to supply the outer dimension, the inner dimension. And that specifies the, 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 the characteristics of it. If you want to make an axle and a bearing, again, you have to specify radii. And the process of cutting things on a lathe gives you a mechanical mechanism whereby you can enter into it a, a radius and the machine then reduces the entropy of the system until it has that radius. When you want to insert a axle into a bearing, you have to minimize what's termed the conditional information between A and B. If A is the axle and B the bearing, you want to have very little information which in B, which isn't already provided, once you know A. Now, we can represent that, that kind of information in binary as follows. You, if I put a 1, I, I mean there's metal there, and if I've got a 0, there's, there's air there. And a slice through the axle will give you something like this. We can generate a very short program to do this. This is a short program which generated that picture. Now, if we wanted to generate the bearing, we want minimal conditional information, and in computing terms, you just negate the, the Boolean values. And that means that the bearing has a very, very close to the minimal conditional entropy in algorithmic terms. But it also has a bearing, uh, sorry, a meaning in real physical terms. Suppose I have a pin here, and there's a fault on the circumference. Look around there. You see that it's not fully circular. There are some zeros where there should be ones, and one, some ones where there should be zeros. That's equivalent to some kind of machining fault. Now, if you want to represent that algorithmically, you have to put extra lines in your program. To do that. If you want to make something like that with a non-algorithmic machine, you, you would actually have to carry out extra steps of filing and grounding to make the parts fit. Now, let's take another example, the production of pottery. This went through three phases historically. The first phase was hand formation with no tools, where the potter just made the thing using their hands. That's very slow, and it also gives irregular-shaped pots. 
the first big invention was to turn things on a wheel. Now, when you turn things on a wheel, the potter only has to supply the dimension of the diameter, and they do that implicitly by moving their hand. And the rotation of the wheel translates that into all the rest of it. But it's still a sequential production process, because the potter has to make a movement like this to provide the, the, the radius at different places. And goods produced that way were still relatively labor-intensive. The first mass production industry actually dates from about the second century AD and is the Roman Samianware industry, which is the first mass production of consumer goods using parallelized pro processes. And that is done by casting. And by casting, they're able to transmit the entire information content of the surface of the, pat, the, the vessel in one operation. And having done that, they're able to provide much more detailed wear. This is Samian wear, and it was typically very decorated. And it could be so decorated because the, the casting mold contained the information that was going to be applied to it. Now, the algorithmic inf the, we can draw a law of algorithmic information. If we have a, a production process P, which is made up of n repetitions of some basic process C, the total information content is going to be bounded by the information content of C plus logarithm of n. Now, that may seem obscure, but what we're saying is the information content of a group of molded pots is bounded by the information content required to make one pot and the number of bits required to specify how many pots you're going to make. Now, in the case of Samian Ware pottery, the original work constitutes the production of a master or pattern piece, which is HC. And then the number of copies that can be made grows exponentially with successive steps of copying, because you can make, suppose L pots can be made with one master. If the master is used to produce molds, which are then used to make pots, you can make L-squared pots. And as you increase the number of successive stages of copying, you'll find that the number of stages of copying that you require grows as the logarithm to the base L of the number of items you want to produce, which is fits the original equation I said. Now, let's look at this, these phases. On a potter's wheel, information is transmitted serially by the potter moving his hands. In Samian wear, it's transmitted in parallel. If you transmit information in parallel, it's faster and you can increase the amount of information in it. The next technique is Parallelization. And this, this is the basic mass production technique that was exploited in the early phases of capitalism, which is moving from a single spinning wheel to a whole set of parallel spinning wheels, all moving at once. And at the same time, the sequencing operation provided by the handloom worker who moves her arm in and out is substituted by the movement of the frame which is moved by a sequencing mechanism similar to the one Babbage's, Babbage used on his um, calculating machines. This shift from sequential to parallel information occurs in lots of areas. We see the big increase in productivity that occurred in the early phases of capitalism 
when there was a shift from manuscript production to printed books. Another example was the invention of iron casting, which enabled the mass production, for instance, of iron railings, but also mass production of cheap iron pots, mass production of cheap iron stoves. There's a similar shift between the Edison phonograph, which was a sequential production process, and the gramophone record, which could be mass produced by printing. In the computer industry, the, the, within the last 50 years, there was a shift from wiring by hand, sequentially, to printed circuit boards. And if we look at the modern semiconductor industry, all the productivity advances you get stem from parallel imaging processes which are used in photolithography. These are some key um, references which I've, I've used in this. It's worth going and looking at Babbage's original book, The Economy of Machinery and Manufacturers. Chayton's book, The Unknowable, gives a good explanation of the theory of uh, information and randomness. And obviously, capital, you as economic students will be familiar with. And I've also referred to James Clark Maxwell's theory of heat. That's the end. Could you put the red button?